Welcome to Imperfect Momming. Our children are constantly looking to us for examples. The term role model doesn't quite cut it here. We are shaping their worldview with every move we make. You see, it's not in the lectures we give or moments where we are actively attempting to teach them. It's in the micro movements we make, the unconscious ways in which we navigate life. We are constantly teaching our children how to show up for themselves, their friends, their future partners, and even their future children. So what can we do to ensure we are raising thoughtful, compassionate, self-aware human beings? We have to become them ourselves. No one is perfect, but we can still all be better, and it starts with self-healing. Let's get to it. Welcome back to Imperfect Momming, and we have a very special guest today, Ellen. Why don't you tell us who you are and what you do? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. My name is Ellen Elizabeth, and I am an author, a sober twin mom, recovery advocate, and infertility warrior. So I represent women women who are dealing with the shame and the struggle that comes from either not being able to quit drinking or not being able to bring a child into this world. So I want to get them to see their full potential and help transform their demons into dreams. Very beautifully stated. That's like, and so many things. My right. brain just <laughs> went in so many different directions just now. Um, but the, well, first I want to talk about you being a sober twin because that's interesting and yeah. different. So do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah. So sober twin mom, I essentially have dealt with addiction since my teens. Um, It started with drug addiction and then I quit drugs and just simply replaced everything with alcohol. So it took me years and years to, you know, come around to the fact that I had a problem. And actually the tipping point was when my husband and I started to try to have a family. Um, We quickly found out that we had some fertility issues and that we would need to do treatments. And the entire time I was drinking very heavily, it actually kind of exacerbated everything and made me drink more because of the stress of all of the treatments and the shame that I was feeling that I couldn't get pregnant. And I was blaming myself for all of the issues and had extreme guilt. Um, And that with addiction just is a vicious cycle. So, um, It was two years of trying while I was still heavily drinking. And then I finally had that pivotal moment where I realized you're probably not going to be able to quit drinking when you do get pregnant. So that's not going to be good. Um, Maybe it's time to think about getting sober. Um, So I essentially knew if I wanted to have the family that I'd always dreamed of that I would have to quit drinking. Um, So I did go to rehab and I got the help I needed and proved to myself, number one, that I was able to get that help. And, you know, at the beginning, the thought of not drinking for one day gave me extreme anxiety and I would go into withdrawals and I could not go for a day. Um, And then just seeing how one day turned into two, which turned into months, which turned into years was just such a miracle. So I was able to start treatments again for um, fertility. And we did end up going through IVF. So um, that's how we got our twins was we put two embryos in and they both stuck. So now we're twin parents. Very cool. So my mind went to that you're a twin (laughs) and you're the sober one or something. I don't know where my mind, but like mom of twins, that's I I always thought twins were like my nightmare, caring as well as like caring for (laughs) it. Right. I, I get, um, I just keep telling people I'm grateful that they're all that I know because it's totally normal to me. Um, had I had just one to start with and then had twins, I'd be like, oh my gosh, this is so much different. Um, but to me having two is normal. The pregnancy quote unquote normal. I hated it. It was miserable, but but of course, now that it's over, I'm like, oh, sure, I would do that again. Right. And how old are your boys now? Um, they're three. They're still little. Uh, yeah, three majors. Oh. But yeah. 
teenagers. Oh, so true. My grandma had seven children and the last pregnancy was twins. Oh, wow. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> no. And she wanted more. Like, I I want to check. I, I wish I could have, like, checked her mental health. Because, right? And it's not a judgment. Like, have as many kids as you want. But just, like, what? Really? Seven? That's right. a lot of kids. That is so many. And just the stress of, for me, having two at the same time of the same age, like I'm already stressed out about when they turn 16 and both, do they both get a car? Do they share a car? Like when they both go to college, we'll be all alone. Like, you know, all the things in the future that are super important to stress about now. (laughs) We have to have these things to stress about, right? (laughs) Right. Exactly. Um, so, and I'm also a surrogate. Oh, cool. So I've been, um, I've birthed three babies that were not mine. Okay. One of them was almost twins, but not quite. Uh, But we did, that was the only time that we did two embryos and one of the embryos split. Got it. But then there was not two heartbeats. So it was technically, it was still one baby, but um, that, that made it a high risk pregnancy because the, they actually thought that the sack was that they shared a sack, which is very rare. Right. And, um, turns out that like there was a sack it was just really really thin but um and then at 30 weeks it was gone like from 20 to 30 at some point it was absorbed they were interesting yeah it is the twin world is just interesting and once you talk about it you learn that so many people either have a twin they are a twin they've dealt with twins it's like there's so many of us out there that have experience with twins but mine was really interesting because um the first ultrasound was at four. I mean, they do it super early for IVF. Um, and they saw two um, sacks, but not two heartbeats. So they said, um, congrats, you're pregnant, but one's not going to make it. So it was incredibly conflicting, confusing emotions. Um, Cause you know, we'd been trying for so long. We were just excited to be pregnant, but then it's like, but you're going to lose one. They said it was going to be, um, the disappearing twin syndrome. And so I was in my brain. I just had this feeling like, no, there's two in there. It's going to be two. I know there's two. And my husband was like, don't get your hopes up. You know, we still have a few weeks. And I was like, nope, there's two, like, just believe me, I can tell. And at eight weeks, they had two heartbeats and I was like, I told you guys, because the doctors were very (laughs) negative. They were like, there's no way this one's going to last. Like it's, it's done. Like, don't even think about it. Just be done. And I was just like, nope. So we didn't have to, we didn't find out the sex until they were born. So it was boy, girl. I forget if I told you that before. Um, But yeah, so one of each and it all worked out. I assumed boys. So. um, Oh, boy, girl. Yeah. Boy, girl. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. It's the, don't question the a mother's intuition, man. Like she's spot on most of the yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. So do you feel like the clients that you work with, is there more that are struggling with um, fertility or more that are struggling with addiction or is it a combination of both like your experience? Um, It depends on the person. I mean, it, there's definitely a big part of my business that's addiction related. Um, but I feel like it's so intertwined with infertility. It's not really talked about. Um, I've heard several people say they're sober now, but when they were trying to get pregnant, if they were dealing with fertility issues, they were really struggling with their drinking too. And I just think the stress of all, I mean, even if they don't, categorize themselves as like addict or alcoholic, but they know that they just want a healthier lifestyle. Um, and they struggled quitting at that time. I just feel the stress is just so astronomical that it's easy to find yourself drinking more in those situations. And it's confusing because it's supposed to be the time when your body is your, you know, the healthiest it can be so that you can house these babies in there and make them healthy and you know we're so hard on ourselves 
thinking that it's all our fault, you know, in my brain, I was like, well, my infertility is caused by all this stuff I've been putting my body through the past 15 years. It's all my fault for this and that and doing drugs when I was 18 and then drinking. And it's just such a mental struggle that it's, it's just so intertwined together. And, and with all of those emotions, the shame on top of it, of like, I'm a woman, I'm supposed to be able to carry a pregnancy. I'm supposed to be able to get pregnant. Like all of the, like, that doesn't help (laughs) any of the process, but we definitely feel it. It's just a vicious cycle, I think. And it's the same with, I mean, there's so much shame with drinking like that. And then there's so much shame with infertility issues it's just both aspects have astronomical levels of shame um, which doesn't help in either situation but it's impossible not to feel that way yeah so do you think that going through your um, sobriety treatment was an instrumental in you getting pregnant like did your body need to be sober Yeah, I think I, I don't feel that like my drinking and drug use caused my infertility. I think it caused a lot of the fear that I was having around what if my babies get this disease that I have, like, what if they struggle with addiction too? And it was just like projecting all of my fears on these kids that weren't even born yet. Um, And So that mentally was just, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And I mean, I've been, there's so many other things that contributed it to my infertility. Like I'd been on birth control for 16 years. I have Hashimoto's, all these things that like are somewhat causes of infertility issues. Um, But essentially I know that if I hadn't gotten sober, I would not have had a healthy pregnancy. So even if I'd been able to get pregnant, I if I hadn't gotten sober first, I don't think I, I don't think that would have pushed me to get sober, if that makes sense. Um, addiction is just, you think things will make you stop and it's not until you're actually ready to stop for yourself that you can make the change. Totally. I've, I haven't ever had a substance addiction. Um, you know, I'm addicted to social media and, (laughs) all the things that most of us have addictions to, but I, I never went down the, um, drug and alcohol route. Um, and there for a a while, I had some judgment for people that did. And then I had like three days of excruciating pain. And I was like, Oh yeah, I, I get it. Like physical, my, my body was hurting. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh yeah, I, I totally understand wanting to numb this pain out right now. Right. And okay. I get it. Like judgment gone. Gone. Yeah. And it's not to say that that's an excuse, but it is a explanation as to why people, you know, go down that path. Right. Yeah. We just don't want to feel the feelings. And then they always say the good thing about getting sober is you're able to feel your feelings again, but the bad thing about getting sober is you're able to feel your feelings again. So it's like, oh, I can actually feel happy and excited, but also I have to deal with all this other stuff that comes with it. I don't like feeling that. Yeah. (laughs) But it's, it's easier to numb it than it is to work through it. And that's why recovery is such a progress process. And I don't think that we are you know, we're not really taught how to healthily express our emotions. We're mm-hmm. taught to shut up, sit down and be quiet. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. do, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear your pain. I don't want to hear your emotions. I don't want to hear anything that you're going through. Like even in our day to day, when you walk by somebody at the grocery store or you walk by a coworker or whatnot, it's like, you say, how's it going? you don't, you're not listening for the answer. Nobody cares. Right. Like I know there was actually one day in, in rehab where 
one of our counselors said, be 100% honest all day today. And so when people said, how are you doing? They're expecting you to just be like, eh, I'm okay. But then you were supposed to be like, well, actually, I feel blah, 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 blah. And the people who asked were just like, why did you tell me all that information? Like no one's used to hearing you say how you actually feel. Yeah. Um, yeah and that's one of the things. Home. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say that's really hard as me right for me right now as a mom because they're in the tantrum whiny I'm going to cry about everything phase and when I hear myself say stop crying you're fine I have to like pull back and remember that they're just trying to express their emotions and I don't want them to learn to stuff it but in the moment I'm just like please stop and it's there's more guilt you know it's just always something as a mom and one of the books that I recommend for that is the no drama discipline. Cause even if it's not a discipline thing that is creating those tears, there's some magic that's in that book Okay, <laughs> that it shifted things for me and my relationship with my son, where I, I don't get as triggered by his emotions as I used to, because I used to, right. and you know, he, even yesterday, he spent most of the day in tears trying to learn how to play a VR game. And it turned out that the VR game was literally rigged against him. So (laughs) he was trying to climb as a, he's this gorilla climbing a wall and it won't, it was set up wrong. So it wasn't registering his movements and he was so frustrated. And several times throughout the day, I was comforting him and, you know, okay, let's take a break because, you know, you're, you're in a, and then I explained to him, which I learned from the book that mm-hmm. when you're in that like heightened state of emotion, your lizard brain is in effect. And when you have your lizard brain taking over, you're not in learning mode. So it doesn't mm-hmm. matter what my boyfriend is telling you what to do, how to fix it. You're not hearing it. Right. No, you're not going to learn it as well. You have to like decompress, take a break, come back, you know, and um, I had gone to the store and we live 30 minutes from, from a Costco. So I had gone to the store and he called me and he's like, mom, you've been gone for four hours. I was like, it's been an hour and a half, but okay. (laughs) You know, but he's like, I need a hug. And that's also mm-hmm. something that I got from the book is to connect with him um, when he's feeling um, activated. And okay. so the first thing that I do is say, hey, do you need a hug? And that's because I know that that's his connection. So your kids may have an, a different way of, of connecting with you. And mm-hmm. only you as the mom can know that. And if you don't, you can test different things like what right. what's working um so he's like but I need a hug and I said okay I'll be home in half an hour you know right um yeah that sounds so, amazing I'd love to look at I'm I took notes so I'm gonna look and it's that. on audible so if you're an auditory listener like I um I love that book I love Dr. Dan Siegel who's the author of the book he has just so many books on parenting and they're all books on parenting disguised as personal development books nice okay (laughs) my my total kind of bait and switch like right I know I've been looking for I just I believe in doing as much research and self-improvement and development as you can and audible is perfect because I just say husband, please, I'm reading, I'm listening to this. Why don't you try two sore on the same page? And then we can talk about it when we're both together. Um, But he's not much of a reader. He's more of a listener. So (laughs) I'm actually an auditory learner. So it's easier for me to retain information when it's read to me. So even, even though I'm also a writer, like I'll sit down and and write things out, but then I'll have word read it back to me because I can catch the mistakes way better. Yeah. I know. I saw on your website, you have a book, which is awesome. 
It's very cool. Opened it up. It's called Ditch the Mom Guilt. I know. <laughs> And that's Perfect. for the readers because I don't mention it on every episode because I just you know self promotion and all. <laughs> right. Yeah. I get it. So, is there a piece of advice that you want to share with our moms? Well, I have advice, but it's also for me because I struggle with it too. But <laughs> um, just always be kind to yourself. Treat yourself like your best friend. Um, don't. So I noticed that every morning I start off really positive and I'm like giving myself affirmations that I am the perfect mom that my kids need me to be and I am doing I am patient and kind and then by the end of the day it's just all out the window and I'm like how could you have done that why did you do this you you know didn't do this right and it's just like I am so hard on myself it's not anything like how I would talk to my best friend I would never say you're a terrible mom why did you do that why did you do this I would say it's okay you did the best you could in that situation and if you can learn from it what would it be so my advice is just to talk to yourself like you would your best friend and to love yourself we're all doing the best we can in every moment um we just have to remember that and I'm I'm speaking to myself right now too because I need to remind myself every day I, I really think that that's the best type of advice is, is the kind that you would give to yourself or even an earlier version of yourself, like something that's been helpful to you or would be helpful to you. Like that's the best kind of advice. Right. Yeah. And I see the kids and I just, I try to remember my inner child too. Mm. And I'm just like, love yourself the way you would love your inner child or your kid right now. Um, so just being compassionate and true and honest with ourselves, but not in a negative way. Um, it's Which you like have needed episode. in those moments when you were crying and upset. And, you know, I would imagine that your parents reacted similarly to how you are reacting. Because right. that's where we learn it from. Or somebody did it. Maybe yeah, not our right. parents, but somebody did. Somebody said, Shh, stop crying. You know? I know, yeah. And I feel like every, like, no matter where you go, it's just kids are expected to act way more mature than they are. You know, we think they can do, they're supposed to be kids right now. They're supposed to be loud and learning things and playing with their food and spitting out stuff. I mean, it's all these things that like make us so anxious, but it's part of what they're supposed to be doing. And I have to remind myself that too, because mm -hmm. I'm like, my anxiety level is a little bit higher than an average person. And so like cleanliness and things like that, I've learned to kind of let go, <laughs> but it took a while. Um, people would joke with me, like, how are you going to handle twins if your house is always spotless? And I'm just like, eh, I'll figure it out. It's not oh, spotless yeah. anymore. <laughs> a friend of mine sent me a TikTok. Um, that was basically a mom telling you how to have the perfect clean house all of the time. Mm -hmm. And it's to get rid of your husband, get rid of your kids and get rid of your pets. And then your house will be like okay. pristine and perfect. Like, <laughs> I love that. it's so funny. <laughs> it's so true too. That's the only way to have I it know. always the way you want it. <laughs> Just send them off. Be like, this is how I want things now. Thank you. Oh, bye. Yep. <laughs> I'll have you know, to, I used to pick you. up. Yeah, Go you ahead. should. That'd be awesome. I was just going to say, I used to pick up their toys like after every time they played. And now I'm just like, Ugh, I don't even bother. Like, what's the point? Like my husband even is like, are you okay? And I'm just like, well, they're just going to throw it all over again anyway. So Wait it's a good exercise for them to like go through and learn to pick up their stuff and you right. know I'm at, at age appropriate whenever that is you know three right. years old seems age appropriate but it's been a while since I had a three-year-old so yeah. maybe not <laughs> I'm trying I'm trying they do sometimes and then other time I actually just made a reel about it how when you're telling your kids to clean up and showed them like throwing everything around and um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> Actually, I, I remember now my son being three and we would sing the cleanup song, right? right? Yep. It's, it, and it, and he would say, I'd say, okay, let's clean up. And he heard 
let's clean up. Let us clean up, which included <laughs> me. And he was like, come on, mom, let's do it. <laughs> We're like, I ah. want you to do it. Yeah, please, you do it. And even to this day, like yesterday, I don't know what happened. I say that there was an earthquake, <laughs> but a box of toys fell upside down because why would it fall right side up where it doesn't dump everything where nothing out? Nothing happens. Yeah. So it fell upside down, dumped everything out. And it'd been like that for two weeks because I was like, I just don't have the capacity right now to, to deal with that. And my boyfriend's like, make him clean it up. And I'm like, but it's, it's not fair. Like he didn't, it's not like he knocked it down, you know, like, and so we did it together and it took less than five minutes and it looks a much, much better. And that's, that's my trick for like, not hating all chores Mm -hmm. (laughs) is that it you most chores take five minutes I know they really do you have a dishwasher when you have a laundry laundry and dryer you know washer and dryer when you have you know a vacuum a good vacuum or whatever like most things take five minutes when you have the right tools Mm -hmm. and I'm like I could do anything for five minutes right so yeah you just have to that's a good way to think about it. Cause there's times when I'm just like, I know my mom is coming over and I'm like, I'm going to leave the laundry and see if she'll fold it for me. <laughs> and then I'm like, I could literally do this in five minutes myself and I'll feel better about myself, not leaving it for her. <laughs> and I even think like letting go of it being done the right way. And I'm using air quotes, like <laughs> the right way. And just letting husband and, and kids help Mm -hmm. with the chores. Like my, a friend of mine said that her kids were unloading the dishwasher and like putting the silverware away at two years old and she didn't do it right. And it didn't matter because she was doing it and she didn't have to do it. Right. Right. Yeah. I've started that with, with dishes and stuff. So where can our listeners find you? I am on Instagram and Facebook. Um, my handle is at it, sorry, at it's Ellen Elizabeth. And my website is www.itsellenelizabeth.com. So I have a few free resources and things on my website you can find. I have a blog. Um, if you want to keep up with my crazy twin stories, you can always sign up for my blog, but, um, I've been pretty active on social media. So Instagram is where I do most of my posting. There's another video I'm going to show you that, and I'll describe it to you for a second, but like it's, it basically says right after the wife cleans the kitchen, husband goes in and there's the song that's playing in the background, like, Oh no. (laughs) You know, and he opens all the drawers, yep. turns on the water, makes a big mess <laughs> everywhere. And my boyfriend sent that to me. And it's like, I feel like he does that with cooking after I clean the kitchen. Like mm-hmm. the kitchen is spotless and then yep. he cooks. Yep. And he has not learned the master, this, this technique of clean as you go. <laughs> I know I do that too. And I'm just like, what is happening here? Thank you for dinner. But also (laughs) thank you for the best (laughs) yeah I'm the same and then like my husband every Sunday my husband does dinner um and he uses the nice dish towels to like clean everything that's dirty and I'm just like those are for hands not for mess (laughs) but Mm -hmm. I've just learned to let that go too Yeah, we have the nicer ones that like are not, so we have red or red and white and they, they're for your hands. And every once in a while, the white ones get retired to the, (laughs) the, um, rag pile because Mm -hmm. they're not white anymore. (laughs) Right. Yep. I totally get it. So, but everything's replaceable and like, how much stress do you want to give yourself worrying about it? I know. Certain things, you just got to let it go. Yes, absolutely. It's not worth it. For your happiness. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, thank you again for being a part of um, my podcast and pouring into our guests and into me. Oh, and yeah. 
We will have another episode of Imperfect Momming next week. And until then, keep healing. Bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to Imperfect Momming. It's time for us to step up and realize that our power is not in trying to shape our children. Our power lies in shaping ourselves into the people we want our children to model themselves after. Don't just do it for your kids. Do it for yourself. When you become a more self-aware, compassionate, and confident person, you and everyone around you benefit. For more information about me and my work, visit alishalyons.com. That's A-L-Y-S-I-A-L-Y-O-N-S.com. See you next time.